This is a brief introduction to knee menisci imaging. First, some anatomy. The medial meniscus is C-shaped, while the lateral is more circular. For the medial meniscus, which is larger than the lateral, the posterior horn is larger than the anterior horn. One way to find out whether you're on the medial side is to look at the symmetry of the tibia. It looks like a golf tee. The lateral meniscus is smaller than the medial. The posterior horn and anterior horn are equal in size. One way to find out whether you're on the lateral side is the asymmetry of the tibia. Another way is the presence of the fibula. A normal meniscus is uniformly dark in signal and has a sharp triangular shape. Some anatomy of the meniscus that can help understand tears. There are long and short collagen bundles. The long circumferential bundles are mostly peripheral, while the short radial fibers tie these together. Histiologically, it's more complex than this, but for our purposes, the simpler approach is what we need. One important thing to consider is the vasculature of the meniscus. The peripheral aspect is known as the red zone and is highly vascular, as shown in the diagram. The mid one-third is known as the red and white zone and is partially vasculature but less so than the periphery. Finally, the inner one-third is the white-white zone is avascular, aneural, and alymphatic. This has implications for possible healing. Because it's avascular, it has less of an opportunity or chance of healing than tears that occur in the peripheral. Meniscal tears. The medial meniscus is more commonly torn than the lateral because of a firm attachment to the MCL. Posterior horn of the medial are the most common type of tears. Isolated anterior horn tears are rare. An example of a tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So abnormal menisci with tears consist of a signal abnormality that touches the articular surface. This equals a true tear. The signal that does not extend to the articular surface does not equal a true tear. This is an example of the non-articular surfaces, the periphery of the meniscus. If the signal extends to that, it doesn't meet criteria for a true tear. If it extends to the articular surface, the superior or inferior articular surface, this is an example of a true tear. How does MRI do for tears? It does well. The sensitivity is 93% for the medial and 80% for the lateral. Specificity is 88% for the medial and 96% for the lateral. Types of meniscal tears. Longitudinal vertical tear, horizontal tear, radial tear, and there are some others, vertical or horizontal flap tear. And a complex tear is a combination of the above. There's also inner surface fraying. The longitudinal vertical tear divides the meniscus into inner and outer segments and tends to occur in younger patients with trauma. The longitudinal vertical tear is highly associated with anterior cruciate ligament tears and has a better healing potential in the absence of T2 signal. If you don't see it on the T2 sequence, it has a better chance of healing. Here's an example of bright joint fluid. So this is a water sensitive sequence. And you can see the tear extending to the periphery as it goes along the circumferential um, fibers of the meniscus. When tears are far peripheral, they can be really hard to detect. A longitudinal a displaced when a vertical longitudinal tear displaces, it can have a bucket handle configuration. Here the bucket handle flap extends into the uh, medial intercondylar notch. This occurs with medial bucket handle tears and you may see the double PCL sign. Here's a normal posterior cruciate ligament. Adjacent to it is the uh, bucket handle type displaced fragment. And here's an example of the double delta sign where you see what look like two anterior horns of the meniscus. And there's the fragment that you see. 
the displacement into the intercondylar notch uh, given rise to the bucket or to the double PCL sign is only seen with the medial meniscus unless there is an anterior cruciate ligament tear. Here's an example of a bucket handle type tear in the axial or transverse plane. The arrows outline the um, donor meniscus and the large arrow outlines or shows the uh, displaced fragment. The reason it's called the bucket handle type tear is it flips over like the handle of a bucket. Horizontal meniscal tears divide the meniscus into upper and lower halves and are the most common type of meniscal tear with the undersurface of the posterior horn being the most common location. These are often degenerative and occur between the collagen bundles. Example, horizontal tear extending to the inferior articular surface of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Uh, horizontal tears can also be associated with parameniscal cysts. When you see a parameniscal cyst, um, it is associated with a tear in greater than 90% of the time. There is an exception, and that's when you see a cyst adjacent to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, which is associated with a tear in 64% of the time. There's an example of a parameniscal cyst. Radial tears divide the meniscus into anterior and posterior portions. They degrade the hoop stress, and you may see uh, the ghost meniscus. The uh, upper image to the left shows a normal appearing meniscus. The next image shows some increased signal. The image with the arrow shows a ghost meniscus with absence of a normal meniscus. And the last image shows return of the meniscus. This is because the radial tear is only imaged on one sagittal section. Another type tear is a flap tear. And this could be a vertical flap tear, otherwise known as a parrot beak tear and it contains a radial portion and then it turns into a longitudinal part. The horizontal flap tear has a short segment of horizontal tear that is displaced. These are unstable and free fragments are not that uh, common. Here's an example of a horizontal flap tear flipped into the medial gutter. Uh, root tears are usually radial, some can be complex, and normally you should see the posterior root on at least one coronal sequence. The lateral posterior root tears are associated with anterior cruciate ligament tears and on the medial side you should see posterior root of the medial meniscus on a slice medial to the posterior cruciate ligament. There's the posterior cruciate ligament, the next slice over you should see normal meniscus and you see this abnormal signal. If the ACL is torn look for a lateral root tear. Complex tears occur when you have a combination of the previously described tears. They, can, they occur in multiple planes. Degenerative maceration refers to uh, the, uh, um, when you have bad um, arthritis of the knee and the meniscus is totally degenerated or absent. Here's an example of a large osteophyte and absence of the meniscus. Another sign to look for is nonlinear subchondral edema adjacent to the meniscal attachments. This has a high specificity for meniscal tear. There's some normal variants or normal anatomy that can be fake outs for meniscal tears. Here's an example of a far anterior attachment of a meniscal root. Here is an example of where the anterior cruciate ligament and the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus meet, giving this increased signal appearance. This is a normal anatomy and should not be um, interpreted as a tear of the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Myxoid degeneration refers to intersubstance degeneration. It's not a true tear. It's not treated. If the signal is well defined and it comes from the periphery, especially in a younger patient, the um, signal is likely secondary to normal vasculature. Meniscal flounce is an interesting configuration and refers to a wavy type appearance of the meniscus. This is not a true tear. One source of confusion is the meniscal femoral ligament or ligaments, and these extend from the medial femoral condyle to the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. The ligament of Risberg is posterior to the posterior cruciate ligament. The ligament of Humphrey is anterior to the posterior cruciate ligament. Here's an example of a meniscal femoral ligament 
that can be confused with the tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And the trick here is to follow it along. Some other help. So this is, uh, or these can, the vertical signal abnormality due to the meniscal femoral ligament can really look like a tear. So you should not see the vertical signal more than 14 millimeters from the posterior cruciate ligament. Here the arrow points to the left to the posterior cruciate ligament. To the right, it points to where you should no longer see vertical signal. And the small arrows point to the ligament. Here's an example. The arrow pointing to the left to the posterior cruciate ligament. The arrow pointing to the right. If this is greater than 14 millimeters and you see the vertical signal, it's a true tear. So here's an example, posterior cruciate ligament. And then the next slice, 14 millimeters away from that slice, laterally, you still see this increased signal, so that is actually a tear. Another source of confusion, the transverse ligament extending from the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. The best way to differentiate these from tears is to follow it along. Here it's easy to see it's not a tear because it's within the anterior fat. It gets closer to the meniscus. And on the third image over, this is where it has the appearance of a tear. And then you get a joining of the uh, anterior horn of the meniscus. Discoid meniscus refers to when a, a variant of a meniscus is disc-shaped rather than C-shaped. It can be a complete discoid, an incomplete, and a risper type. They occur more common in the lateral meniscus rather than the medial and they may maintain the semilunar shape in the um, incomplete type. In order to identify these, you look at a mid-coronal image, and the meniscus shouldn't extend more than 13 to 15 millimeters. If your slices are 4 to 5 millimeters, then you should not see more than two bow ties. One, two bow ties, three bow ties, and four, and that equals a discoid meniscus. The Risberg type is when the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus lacks a posterior attachment and leads to hypermobility. Here is lack of attachment posteriorly, and here is normal attachment. And in this case, the ligament of Risberg is the only structure that is stabilizing the meniscus. T1 versus T2 signal intensity. Lower TE sequences are more sensitive but less specific. Higher TE sequences are more specific but less sensitive. You see the tear on the T1, but you don't see it on the T2. That still equals a tear. The opposite, if you see it on the T2, it's a true tear. Treatment of the meniscus consists of the three R's. That's resection, repair, and replacement. The first R is resection. This usually is a partial meniscectomy. Rather than complete, the goal is to leave as much normal meniscal tissue as possible, and it is performed when the tear is not amenable to repair. Usually a non-peripheral horizontal tear, oblique flap, that's vertical or parapeak, or a complex tear. The damaged um, loose meniscal tissue is removed. The second R is repair, and this is usually performed for post-traumatic vertical peripheral tears at or near the joint capsule in younger patients. The third R is replacement. And this is done with an allograph in skeletally mature, non-obese patients that tend to be young with stable joints. The alignment should be normal. The contraindications are advanced cartilage loss, chondrosis, and infection. This concludes the talk. There are many other musculoskeletal imaging talks on the website.